My assignment tonight is pretty formidable. You never really understand as a pastor what impact your, the sermons that you deliver will have day by day, moment by moment, hour by hour. You prepare sermons weeks in advance, sometimes, sometimes hours in advance, whatever the Holy Spirit does to you. But you prepare messages sometime in advance and you never really understand the impact of what you said, what you didn't say, and what you're going to say. I was reminded today as my wife and I lay down for a few moments, didn't sleep, but I was reminded for a, very, for a few moments as we began to discuss and she began to shed some tears for, out of human fear. I never really understood how much I love Thomas. Thomas gets a bad rap from most Christians. But Thomas, just like foot-shaped mouth Peter, is like so many of us. And I was reminded as my wife and I spoke and I tried to encourage her and we tried to encourage one another in the Lord and of the impact that some of the things that I say have. You know, you always know that as a pastor. You always understand uh, that what you say has eternal consequences, good or bad sometimes. You always understand the fact that when you stand in the pulpit, no matter if it's to 10 people or it's to 500 people, you always understand that you are breaking the bread of life and that you're giving out God's absolute, inerrant, infallible truth. And it's a job that should not ever be taken lightly. But sometimes that truth hits home more than others. Sometimes you see in the things that you have said and you see in the things that you're about to say, or at least your notes say that you're about to say, you see, some, you see how what you're about to say could really help or you see that the things that you are planning on saying by way of your non-God inspired notes how that actually has a lot to do with what we face right now if there's anything that I want you folks to understand that God is trying to reveal number one in his resurrection is not only that He is the powerful Lord of all, and obviously that's true. It's not only that He has the power of life and death, which that also is true. It's not only the fact that because I live, you too shall live, although that is true. It is also not to fulfill the enormous amount of prophecies that we look, we've looked over the last few weeks. It's not only to crush the head of the serpent, while all those things are true. But I believe that one of the main things, that the main ideas that Jesus Christ, the main pictures that Jesus Christ wants to paint for us in His resurrection is this, and hang on to these words, I am faithful and I will do what I said I will do. I am faithful and I will do what I said I will do. Folks, listen, if you and I have not grasped that, then none of the other things mean any, they don't mean a thing. If you and I have not grasped the fact that Jesus said, I will do, I am faithful, and I will do what I said I will do, it doesn't matter if we believe that his resurrection and death were fulfillment of prophecy. If we have not come to grips with the fact that Jesus Christ said, I am faithful, and I will do what I said that I will do, it doesn't matter. Because unless we believe it, it doesn't matter. Jesus has told some wild and wacky stories in his ministry. 
the prodigal son being one of them, absolutely drove the Pharisees bats with that story. That's become my favorite parable because it just drove the religious system absolutely nuts. You can get that sermon on the, on the website, by the way, too. But Jesus did some pretty strange things as well. And one of the things out of everything that he, has, that he did that we would classify as strange in his ministry, one of the things that he did was when he resurrected, the first thing he did was appear to a woman. Now if you understand Jewish culture, you understand why that's so weird. Women didn't have really a say-so in Judaism. They really didn't have a place in Judaism. They, they really were possessions. They were, they were property. They really were not people. And they were treated as such. And for Jesus Christ to pick a woman to be the first person that sees Him after His resurrection was absolutely phenomenal. And not only a woman, I mean, I could understand him maybe appearing to Lola or Bonnie or any of you ladies. I could understand him appearing to some of you, but to appear to a woman of the caliper of Mary Magdalene, to appear to a woman that the Bible says that he had cast out seven demons, now, church history is often recorded for us, and, and when I brought this up in the youth Sunday school class this morning, one of my students in the back blurted this out, Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. Well, church history has recorded that throughout the years, but the Bible doesn't record that. Now, it's possible. I mean, a woman that's possessed by seven demons is probably nothing that she wouldn't do, but let's go with what the Bible says about her. And the only thing we know about her soiled past is that she was possessed by seven demons. But no doubt, whether she was in the act of prostitution or not, no doubt she lived a very soiled and very wicked lifestyle before coming face to face with the Lord of glory. And for that to be the woman, woman in general, but for that to be the woman in which Jesus chooses to show himself at first. Absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely the product of sovereign grace. That's all we can say about grace. John Newton said it was amazing, but John Newton also believed in sovereign grace. And so it was also sovereign. And for Jesus to do that, because he had one goal in mind, as we looked at last week, he wanted to show himself faithful. Faithful. You and I live life, and sometimes we blame God for when things go wrong. Now, some of you may be more spiritual than I am, but I doubt it. Probably all of you have done that at least once because you're human. We live life and we blame God for when things go wrong, not understanding. Folks, listen, God is faithful. The Lord of glory is faithful. He will do what he said that he will do. And what you and I need to do is look past our problems and see the Lord of glory. That is the sovereign creator and the sovereign Fixer of those problems. I couldn't think of an alliterated word there, Fletch, so I just said, you'd bad grammar say fixer. That works. You get the idea. We need to look past those things. And folks, listen. It wasn't until Mary Magdalene looked past her sorrow that Jesus said, Miriam, And she recognized him. Why? Because when I called, Jesus said in John 10, as the good shepherd, I call my sheep, they know my voice, they hear my voice, they follow me. Jesus says, my sheep know me. They hear me. And I know them. I know them. 
And this woman was a changed woman at the tomb. She was a changed person. Well, let's go a little further in our studies. Not only did he resurrect to show himself faithful, but he appeared, he resurrected to send the faithful. To send the faithful. And that's in John chapter 20, beginning in verse number 19. And we're going to look at this very quickly. He first appeared to show himself faithful. Secondly, he appeared to send the faithful. The faithful. Now God's got it. Now Jesus has got another purpose in mind in appearing to the ten. Thomas isn't there. In verse 19 it says this. <coughs> then the same day at evening being the first day of the week. Stop right there. Now it's important for us, I believe, that the Holy Spirit makes that note for us. Because what this does, folks, is this changes the whole economy of things. From now on, believers do not worship on the Sabbath. We worship on the first day of the week. And this has been the practice throughout the church age. This was the practice throughout the book of Acts. And in fact, in the book of Revelation, we see the same thing. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. John says, this is a new day. We don't worship on the Sabbath anymore. We worship on the new day, the day of resurrection, the first day of the week. That's why we meet on Sunday and not on Saturday. Because the resurrection took place on Sunday. And I'm not going to go over the, the clock with you. We did that the first week. To prove that Jesus Christ actually did rise on the third day, which was Sunday. This is our, this is our resurrection day. This is the Lord's day. And the Spirit of God makes that point very clear. Now there's a sect of people. Seventh-day Adventists that they worship on the Sabbath. There's a lot of other things wrong with their doctrine, but that's one of them. We don't worship on the seventh, the seventh day anymore. We don't worship on the Sabbath. We worship on the first day of the week, the resurrection day, the Lord's day. Now get the picture here of, what the, of what's going on with these crazy disciples. The Holy Spirit makes that little note for us. And then he goes on and says this. When the, the, door, the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Now the Bible says that the doors were shut. Now in the Greek that means two things. If you look that word up, it means two things. That means locked and barricaded. Not only were the disciples shut up inside of a room, but the disciples were shut up in this room with the doors locked and the doors barricaded. Why? For fear of the Jews. These guys were in the upper room, shivering in terror, expecting any minute the temple police to come and get them. But this is so good. What's it say? And Jesus came. Sometimes Jesus waits till he starts shivering. Then Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said, Peace be unto you. Oh man, Jason, that must have been something. I would have loved to have been there. And here you got these guys shivering in terror, the doors locked and barricaded. And here Jesus comes in and the midst stands in the middle of them and says, Peace be unto you. Fantastic. Now here's the question that sometimes I like to sit back and knock the hammer back in my chair and go into my thinking mode. And here's, how did he get in there? Well, as normal, there's a whole, there's a plethora of thoughts. And when I, when I study a passage, I'll read many, many commentaries to get different people's perspectives. Some of these guys are absolutely wacko. Well, why do you have their books, Pastor? I don't know. I guess I like reading after wackos. One commentator said he climbed through a window. 
Well, that would have been a little difficult in the upper room. Some said he slipped down from the roof. First St. Nick. One commentator said that he sneaked in before they locked the door and he hid himself in the corner and then revealed himself. One writer said that the doorkeeper lied and let him in. Boy, people go to great lengths to get rid of the miraculous, don't they? Well, how did he get in? He walked through the wall, right? You say, Pastor, you really believe that he walked through the wall? Absolutely I do. Listen, if Jesus Christ could ascend out of grave clothes, what's a wall? What's a wall to the Creator? If Jesus Christ in His physical form prior to His resurrection could walk on water, what do you think that He could do after His resurrection when Mark tells us that He had a heteros morphe, He was in another form, He was in a glorified form, don't you think that it would have been simple for Jesus to rearrange the molecules and walk through a wall? Absolutely. Now they panicked when Jesus came in there. Jesus come, I mean, they're already scared. And Jesus comes in there, stands in the middle of them and says, Peace be unto you. And they're already scared. In fact, Luke tells us in Luke chapter 24, they said it's a ghost. It's a phantom. Let me tell you something, folks. Does this sound like guys that are manufacturing a resurrection? You know, we looked at last week, that was one of the onslaughts on the resurrection that the disciples just manufactured the resurrection. Does this sound like guys that are going to go and steal a body that's sealed by Rome and guard it with two Roman soldiers? Does this sound like a bunch of people that are going to go, go past those guys, steal a body, and fabricate a resurrection? All you got to do is read and let the Bible speak for itself. And he came, in, he, he came into the room and in verse 20. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. I was asked by a student some years ago. They said, Pastor, does, do you believe that Jesus Christ has those wounds in his glorified body. Pastor, do you believe that Jesus Christ still has the nail prints in his hand and the spear uh, wound in his side? And I said, I most certainly do believe that he'll have those for all eternity. Prove it, preacher. Well, Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6, John says he sees a lamb that, he, that comes and opens the seals. And he, John says this, it was a lamb that looks like he had been slain from the foundation of the world. How could Jesus be a lamb that looked like that he had been slain unless he had the wounds in his flesh? So certainly, Jesus will have those wounds for all eternity. That's how we're going to know him when he comes for us. And so what the disciples saw was their exalted Lord. And Jesus Christ comes to them that night to give them a commission. Look in verse 21. And then as Jesus said to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. He says, I am on a commission from God, and that same commission that I am on from God, I am going to give to you. Now, folks, listen, there were not just the 11 in this upper room. There were women in this upper room, and there were other followers of Jesus in this upper room. So this commission just did not go to the 11 apostles. It went to a whole group of people. He says, you're going to be the sent ones. You're going to be the ones that are going to carry the gospel. Folks, listen, that's our first commission. That's the first phase of the commission. That is our task. Our task is to carry the gospel to the world. Right? Someone said to me, well, I don't believe that you should carry the gospel to anyone that's not the elect. Oops. 
I said, well, my hyper-Calvinist friend, Charles Spurgeon had a wonderful response to that, and I think it's very apropos to your statement to me. If God would put a giant E on their backs, then I would just preach the gospel to them. But we don't know. God hasn't chosen in his sovereignty to give us that information. And praise God he hasn't. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. But our job as obedient people is to carry the gospel to the world and let God decipher who are the chosen ones. That's not our task. And anybody who will use the great biblical doctrine of election as an excuse not to evangelize has a dreadful heart problem. And doesn't understand the biblical doctrine of election. And doesn't understand it at all. The biblical doctrine of election brings glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we, and we praise His glorious name because of sovereign grace. It doesn't give us an excuse not to evangelize. Jesus Christ was very clear to this group of men and women in this room that night. As a father has sent me, even so send I you. Your task, your job is to carry the gospel to the ends of the world. And you know what Jesus, Brother Blue, he doesn't even bring up. And I will save those whom I have chosen. Because the disciples don't need to worry about that. We are the body of Christ, folks. As the church, we are the body of Christ. And the body has a job to give the gospel to the ends of the earth. Jesus said to these men and the women in that upper room, as the Father sent me, even so send I you. I read this quote. Christians, he says, are like a whole lot of people with colds all sitting around sneezing at each, at each other, because, but nobody catches it because everybody's got it. That sounds like a Tozer or a McGee blue, but I don't know who actually said that. But isn't that true? That's true. We sit around so much, us four no more, shut the door. And we sit around so much with that type of attitude, we're like people sneezing on each other, but nobody gets a cold because we've already got it. Listen, that's why you don't hear me preach a whole lot of salvation message. How many of you have ever heard me preach a gospel message since you've been here? Huh? It was all gospel the past couple sermons. Well. Be quiet. How many of you ever heard me go through the plan of salvation on a sermon? Not many, not much, do you? Why do I need to give Blue the gospel? He's already got it. We need to take it to the ends of the world. And that's how we must live. That's how we must move. We must take the gospel and make contact with people in the world because we are the sent ones of Jesus Christ. We are, folks, listen, the continuing ministry of Christ. He proves himself faithful when he appeared to Mary Magdalene and now he's going to send the faithful. I like verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. The Greek has it, he blew on, on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Now, this is one of those things that theologians have had a lot of have had a lot of difficulty in years dealing with this verse, trying to figure out whether the disciples at this point really received the Holy Spirit or not. Now, I can remember in seminary when we were studying the Gospel of John, going through it again. Well, there's all kinds of discussions, Jason, about, well, the disciples really received the Holy Spirit. Well, first thing that I want you to understand is that the text doesn't say that they did. Now, follow me. Jesus says, breathe on them and said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Does the text say that they did? No. You say, well, preacher, you don't believe that they received the Holy Spirit? No, I don't. At this point, no, I don't. And I'll tell you why. Because I believe that the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that the Spirit of God came when? 
Did not Jesus Christ say back in chapter 16 that if I go not away, the Spirit cannot come, but when I go, then the Spirit will come? You say, well, what's going on here? Folks, listen, plain and simple, when Jesus Christ did what He did in verse 22, this plain and simple is just a pledge on Christ's part that the Spirit will come. Just a promise. Because listen, if they had received the Holy Spirit right here, I don't believe we'd have a verse 26. What's it say in verse 26? Eight days later, what was wrong with them? They're still up there locked in that room. If these guys had received the Spirit eight days earlier, they wouldn't be locked in the room still eight days later. They wouldn't be up there still fearful for their lives if they had received the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said what in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8? You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be what? Witnesses. Not huddled up in some room. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit of God, folks, so that you can huddle up with each other in a room and be scared to death. Not only does verse 26 indicate for us that they didn't receive the Holy Spirit, but listen, folks, in chapter 21 and verse 4, had they received the Holy Spirit in chapter 20, they would have recognized Him in chapter 21 and verse 4. They would have recognized Him in chapter 21 and verse 12, but they did not recognize Him, indicating for us that they did not have the Spirit at that moment that they needed in order to be able to recognize Christ. This, folks, listen, this is verse 22 is just a simply a pledge that Jesus Christ is promising them that they will receive the Holy Spirit. And may I add this? This is a pledge for all believers. Every believer possesses the Holy Spirit. And let me go a step farther for my Pentecostal friends. Every believer possesses all of the Holy Spirit. All of the Holy Spirit. Listen, as a believer, we don't have to hunt down the Holy Spirit. As believers, we have the Holy Spirit. In fact, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, Paul says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's what? None of his. None of his. All believers have the Spirit. Not only does he give them a commission to go to the world and give the gospel of the resurrection, as we saw last week, the new mercy seat, right? Right? The new mercy seat. Here's the power. I'm going to give you the power. That Holy Spirit is going to surge within you and is going to give you the ability to be able to do what I've commanded you to do. And then he gives them a third thought. This is really fantastic. Verse 23. Whoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whoever sins you retain, they are retained. You say, preacher, I actually have the power through the Holy Spirit to go to somebody and say, your sins are forgiven. Yours, uh uh-uh. Do I have that power? Can we go around telling people your sins are forgiven, your sins aren't? Is that what Christ is teaching? Obviously, that's not what He's teaching. Mark chapter 2 and verse 7, the Bible says, who can forgive sins but God? And the obvious answer is nobody. So obviously, it doesn't mean that. Well, our Roman Catholic friends, for years have indicated for us that the, that this means that the apostles were here and they were given the right of absolution. They were given the right to forgive sins. And in the papal secession, Peter being the first pope and all the popes after that, also have the right of absolution of sins. That the pope can forgive sins. Folks, listen, that doesn't make any sense from any angle. I know I'm preaching to the choir on this. That doesn't make sense from any angle, least of all a textual one. Because what the Roman Catholic Church fails to realize is, as I said before, it just wasn't the 11 in this upper room. They were women and other disciples in this upper room as well. So if what the Roman Catholic Church says, teaches is true then not only does the Pope have power to forgive sins, but ladies, so do you. You have the power to say someone is forgiven or not. That's quite a bit of power. You think you ladies can handle it? Y'all are not the problem. It's those guys that are the problem. But that's the problem with that teaching. You say, 
you say, well, so pastor, are you saying that the whole church has a right of absolution? No, that's not what I'm saying either. You say, well, what are you saying? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked. I'll tell you. Here's what Jesus is saying. Anyone, you can go up to somebody and say, your sins are forgiven. You can go up to somebody and say, your sins are not forgiven. Totally and solely on the basis of what they do with Jesus Christ. If someone bows the knee before the Lordship of Christ, if a man who's conscious of his sins repents toward God and believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you can say to that person, my friend, your sins are what? Forgiven. But the same, but a different person who willfully rejects and will not believe and refuses Christ, you can say your sins are not forgiven. And you and I have a right to say someone's sins are forgiven or someone's sins are not forgiven totally on the fact of what they've done, what they have done with Jesus Christ. And so Jesus says to these guys, whoever, whoever sins, ye remit, they are remitted based on what they did with Christ. And those whoever sins, ye retained, they are retained based on what they did with Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ comes to show Himself faithful. Jesus Christ comes to send the faithful. And thirdly, and lastly, and very, very quickly, Jesus Christ resurrected to secure the faithless. To secure the faithless. And this is our dear friend and fellow laborer, Thomas. And we'll look at him briefly because our time is about gone. Thomas, if you look at verse 24, is where we begin looking at him. Thomas was the proverbial pessimist. Doesn't believe anything. I've told you this story before. I remember when Mark was about five or six years old, we would plan a trip or we would plan something that he was looking forward to. Uh, trips to the dentist, you know, things like that. No, we were planning trips and things he was looking forward to and a weird kid. And... Uh, and, and I can remember, and you can ask him, and he still remembers. He's reminded all the time. I can remember, Mark, we, we would talk about the trip and talk about how much fun we're going to have, talk about what we're going to do to the other two boys at the time. And here's Mark from the back seat in his car chair, car seat. Probably ain't going to work out. Probably a rain anyway. We won't be able to go. I don't know if that boy was setting himself up not to be disappointed in case something happened. We've never not done something that we said we would do. I don't, I don't really know what caused him to, to have that attitude. But Mark was a proverbial pessimist. And oh yeah, by the way, he still can be. Still can be. Nothing ever is going to work out with Thomas. Everything is going to go wrong. God's a liar. He can't believe his truth. He can't believe his word. He's just a pessimist. Just like us, Thomas has his doubts. He doubts, and he doubts, and he doubts. You remember the time there in chapter 11 of this gospel where Jesus said to these words to his disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem. Remember that? And the disciples said, Lord, those guys there are trying to kill you. If you go to Jerusalem, they're going to, you'll die. And what was Thomas's response? No, 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 no. You don't understand. You know, if he's following the Father's mandate, you know, if he's following the Father's command and, and he goes to, to Jerusalem, the Father will protect him and will protect us all. Not quite. Thomas says, well, hey, if he's going to go and die, let's go die with him. Always the pessimist. Always the glass half empty. Always looking at something from the dark side. Remember in chapter 14, when Jesus Christ says, I'm going away and I'm going to come and bring you to myself? What was Thomas' response? Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Was that his response? Lord, we don't know where you're going. We don't know how to get there. You see, with Thomas, everything is a disaster. 
Because Thomas doesn't have solid faith. He's a skeptical kind of guy. And you know what? We come to Thomas. And you know what the beautiful thing is about this blue? The Lord meets him at the point of his faithlessness. The thing I love so much about the Lord, many things, but one of the things I love about the Lord is that he never forsakes his own. In fact, Paul says, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13, one of the greatest verses in the Bible, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Even when our faith runs clear down out of gas, God will meet us at the point of our weak faith and he'll lift us up again because he cannot deny his own. We're bought with a price. We belong to Him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. I belong to Him. Because I belong to Him, He cannot deny me. I'm so glad that Jesus Christ doesn't try to force me up to a level of faith without first coming down to where I am. The old song where it goes, He came down to my level because I couldn't get up to His. It says in verse 24, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, that means twin, was not with them when Jesus came. Let this be a lesson to you folks of what happens when you miss church. You might just miss Jesus. Well, that's probably forcing something on the text, so we'll move on. <laughs> verse 25. Verse 25, then the other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. Thomas, can you imagine John? Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And you know, Thomas, Mr. Rain on everybody's parade said, well, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and burst my hand into his thrust my hand into his side i will not believe now that's a skeptic that's a skeptic you know something else i see here that i absolutely love i love the fact that the disciples cared enough about him and went to him I wonder how many Christians are casualties of war because other Christians couldn't be bothered to encourage them. My heart broke some months ago. We had a gentleman that came here years and years ago before any of you folks, years and years ago. In fact, he's one, one of the persons responsible for this put, installing our sound equipment. He had sound audio background. And he, he and his wife and his stepdaughter came to our church for some, for some months, almost a year probably. They got saved, supposedly got baptized. And we tried like anything to encourage him to do right. To encourage him, I used to go to him regularly and I said, Brother, I said, you only grow as much as you're in church. I said, you will not grow by watching the electronic church. I said, church, preachers on television have their place, but their place is not when your local church is meeting because God's not going to bless that. And I encouraged him as best I could. Brother, here are our services. What can I do for you? What can I do for you and your wife to help you? My wife and I try to keep his 18-year-old uh, stepdaughter busy. Uh, I always had plenty to do with my four boys at the time, so we tried to keep her busy in, in our home. And, and she came to the school here and was active in the youth department and tried our best. Well, she graduated from high school and joined the Army. And we didn't see him anymore. Except for one time, his wife got caught selling cigarettes to an underage person in the drugstore. And so I think a day before a court hearing, she was in church. You know, everybody's got to get things right with God before something drastic happens. But we haven't seen them since. And then we would call, and they wouldn't return our calls, and, and, uh, and they wouldn't accept encouragement. 
One Sunday morning, my father and I were back in his study having a meeting. And he says, I'm going to read a letter to you. And I'm going to paraphrase this letter. Pastor Steve and Pastor Michael and Emmanuel Baptist Church. I do hereby request that my name be permanently removed from the membership roles of Emmanuel Baptist Church. I have since learned that the doctrine of the Baptist Church on the deity of Jesus Christ is a lie and is false and is not biblical, and I have joined the Kingdom Hall of, Je of the Jehovah's Witnesses. That, that story was refreshed in my mind because I saw that man in town Friday. And he acted as though he didn't know who I was. He acted as though he was speaking to an absolute stranger. And I was the one that lifted that man up and carried him into, the, into this baptistry pool and helped my father baptize him because he was a paraplegic. And he acted as though he didn't even know who I was. I'll be honest with you. I sat there, I saw him at Subway, I was eating a salad. And I, I'll be honest with you, I sat there and as I saw him eat with his JW friends, I asked myself this question, did I do everything that I could? Did I do enough? But you know what the fact is, folks, that's up to God. I can't beat myself up about that. But the fact is, is this, we need to be people that go to the skeptic that go to the sinner, that go to the Christians having a hard time, that go to the Christian whose marriage is breaking up, that goes to the Christian who's, who's got a rebellious son or daughter, to go to the Christian whose husband has just been found out as guilty of adultery, to go to the husband whose wife has just been found out that she's an adulteress, to go to the couple who is sitting on the verge of bankruptcy. I don't care, folks, listen, I don't care what stupid mistakes they've made to get them there. That doesn't matter. They're there. You know, we spend far too much time blaming people's problems on, well, you did this, you did that, you did the other. You deserve to be there. Hogwash. That's got to be the epitome of unloving and unchristlike. And would to God that somebody had more grace on us if we were there than we have on other people sometimes. We need to be people to go to those people. They may not receive that encouragement, but that's not up to you. And I love, as I read this account, I love the fact that the disciples just didn't write Thomas off. They went and they found him. And they said, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. They didn't write Thomas off because he had dropped out of church. He had gone back to his old way of life. He was a skeptic. He wouldn't believe he had trouble with faith. They went to him. They were like what Paul talked about in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. If a man see a brother overtaken in a fault, ye who are spiritual, go to him in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be what? Tempted. Don't go with the spirit of pride. Don't go with the spirit of haughtiness. But go with the spirit of meekness. Understanding that except it be for the grace of God, that would be you. And these disciples came to Thomas and said, Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And you know what happened? Thomas was still, still a skeptic. But you know where he was the next Sunday? Here yeah, I'm forcing it on the text again. He was in church. He was gathering with the disciples in the upper room. The next, he, would, he still didn't believe, but at least he was there. Listen, if we just write off those Christians that are having struggles, they may not ever find the help. And they may come back to church still a skeptic. They may come back here still having a hard way to believe. But they're here. That's half the battle. They're back around God's truth. The Bible says in verse 26, and after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Boy, it's just amazing when a brother goes up to another brother and says, I love you. I know what's going on in your life. Can I help you? I had to call somebody today one of those calls I hate to make, and I, 
I called him today and I said, first of all, I want you to know this is not necessarily an accusatory call. I just want to see if I can help you. I've gone up to people before, and again, I'm not the example, but I'm all I've got. Because I get it right every now and then. Every so often. Even a, even a, even a, even a retarded squirrel finds a nut. <laughs> right? <laughs> and I've gone to people and I've said, you know, church isn't the same without you when you're not here. We miss you. Why don't you come on back? Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. But you know what? That's not up to me. That's not up to you. They wouldn't got Thomas. Thomas, we've seen the Lord. Well, I don't know, but he was back. He was back the next Lord's Day. Then came Jesus and said to Thomas, Shame on you. How dare you doubt me? Peace be unto you. Boy, don't you like that? No judgment. No ridicule. No shame. Peace. Peace be unto you. And I don't, and folks, listen. I believe with all my heart when Jesus said that, he was looking right at Thomas. Because that's why he was there. The other guys already believed that he was there for the sake of Thomas. And when he walked in, when he went through that wall again and appeared in the middle of him, he looked right at Thomas, the doubter, and said, Peace be unto you. You know, God's got a lot on his plate, doesn't he? He's a busy guy. I mean, he's got a whole universe to run. But yet in the midst of all of that, he cares about the weak faith of one little disciple. Jesus should have come in that room and he would have had every reason and every right to come in that room and said, shame on you, Thomas, for not believing me. But he comes in that room and he says, peace be unto you. Why? Get this, hang on to this thought, folks. Listen, because a loving Christ always meets us at the point of our faithlessness to bring us to faith. I had someone look at me the other day and he said, Pastor, I just don't believe God anymore. I hear the promises. I hear the pastor preach. I hear you preach about the promises of God and preacher. I just don't see them. I don't believe God anymore. It's over. I'm done. And he said, and they said, now I, now I suppose God's getting ready to strike me. I said, no, not at all. I said, in fact, God is ready to meet you at your lowest level of faith. God's not care about your doubts. God's not concerned about your doubts. Your, your doubts don't shake him. Your doubts don't move his stability. He's God and he'll always be God whether you doubt or whether you believe. He's God. I said, he'll meet you at, the, at your lowest point, at your weakest point of faith. He, he's not interested, folks. Listen, he's not interested in browbeating you. He's not interested in harping on you about your faith. You know what? Some Christians have such a warped view in their theology. And I'm talking Baptist have some Baptists have such a warped view in their theology about God that they picture a God that's ready to strike them down at their first weak moment in faith. Yeah. But I am so glad that the strengths of Jesus Christ meet us at the point of our weaknesses. Jesus comes to Thomas in verse 27. He says, Thomas, reach in your finger. Go ahead. Here it is. Look at my hands. Put your finger in the wound of my hands. Put your hand 
and thrust it into my side. And don't be faithless, but believe. Thomas, you wanted to set up this little test? Well, here it is. Here's the test. I'll meet you on your ground, Thomas. You know, some people, I've heard some preachers, Brother Blue, give Gideon a fit because he laid out a fleece three times. I've never given Gideon a fit over that, and I don't believe that I will because you know what God does? Sometimes God meets us on our ground. Sometimes God meets us, or many, every time God meets us on the level of our faith. That was Gideon's level of faith. And so God said, that's okay, I'll come down to your level of faith, and I'll honor it. And that's what he did with Gideon, that's what he did with Thomas, and that's what he'll do with you. He'll come down to your level of faith, wherever that level is. I don't care how weak you think it is, he will come down to your level of faith, he will meet you there, and he will slowly, gradually, lovingly, caringly caress you up to his faith. Because he loves you. But I believe, folks, that Thomas was an honest doubter. And I believe that Thomas was an honest doubter because I don't believe if he had been an honest doubter, I don't believe Christ would have met him. But he was an honest doubter. Because the Bible says, if you seek me with all your heart, you'll what? You'll find me. Now, if you want to put the test up and it's an honest test, God says, I'll meet you there. Jesus said in chapter 17, verse, chapter 7 rather, verse 17, if any man wills to do my will, he shall know the doctrine. And Thomas really wanted to know. That was his test. But you know something? Thomas was an exaggerator, like most of us who doubt. In fact, I looked at that person that told me this the other day, and I said, oh, stop being such an exaggerator. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Don't be such an exaggerator. Thomas, you aren't so tough. Your doubt isn't so founded. Because what don't you read in the text, folks? Thomas never followed through with the test that he set up. The text never says he actually put his finger in his nail print and thrust his hand in his side. But what did he do? He immediately bowed and said, My Lord and my God. Now I believe. Now I believe. All he needed was to do was to see. And that is the greatest confession that has ever been made. Some people come along and say, Well, Jesus wasn't God. Well, according to that verse, there's no question about it. And you notice that Thomas doesn't say, The Lord and the God. He says what? My Lord and my God. That's a personal relationship. And that's the greatest confession any man will ever make. And that was quite a confession. You see what Jesus did? Jesus went to the level of his faithlessness and he brought him up to his faith. He'll meet you where you are, even as a believer. When your faith well runs dry which it will from time to time, he'll meet you there if you're honest in your doubt. In verse 29, Jesus Christ lays another principle. He says, Thomas, because you have seen and believed, you're blessed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. You know who that is? That's you and me. Jesus says, Thomas, Thomas, this is a good thing. That you've seen, now you believe, and you trust. Oh, but it's greater to believe when you haven't seen anything. And you know what? Since the time of Thomas, there have been hundreds, thousands, literally millions who have believed in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ without seeing any bit of evidence, personally, physically themselves. And you know something? As a Christian, when we mature, we grow from that low faith that must see to that faith that doesn't need to see. As you see God work in your life, as you see God work in your church, as you see God work in the lives of your wife and your, and your husband and your kids, then that low-level faith that you, have to, that you have that needs to see when you're first saved grows to where you believe and you don't have to see. 
And so Jesus says, Thomas, I met you where you were, but it's a lot better to stay up there on that level of believing on me. And that's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we walk by faith, not by sight. There he is, the resurrected Christ. Resurrected in power, resurrected in glory. The evidence is all in. No one could ever deny that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He appeared to show his faithfulness. He appeared to show the faithful. And he appeared to secure the faithless. And then John adds two more verses. As, as, as this verse 30 and 31 are the purpose verses. Every, every book of the Bible has a purpose verse. Verses 30 and 31 are the purpose verses of the Gospel of John. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life, what? Through his name. John wants us to believe that Jesus is God in order to have life. John says, I want you to see that Jesus Christ is alive. I want you to see that he is the resurrection and the life so that you might believe and so that you might have life. Brother Fletch, pray for us.